Hi there and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith and in this video we're going to learn the one to four player game Tiny Epic Tactics designed by Scott Alms and published by Gameland Games who helped sponsor this video. It was a quiet woodland with peaceful rivers and snowy peaks and then the warriors showed up. Swords were swung, arrows loosed and spells cast but only one team will emerge victorious and it's time to find out who. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. The game comes with instructions for five different modes of play, but all of them are based off of the two to four player competitive mode, which we're going to learn in this video. To set up, assemble the evergreen forest by placing the scroll on the table. I've set it on top of a little board that I have here that doesn't come with the game, but I'm just using this so I can move things around the table a little easier in this video. You then place all the included boxes into their positions like I'm doing here, ensuring that all the artwork is facing in the same orientation. You'll also find this illustrated here in the rulebook if you need a reminder. These are the double-sided unit cards. Ensure the sides that say solo enemy here are face down and then separate them into four piles based on their class symbols here. Fighters, rogues, wizards, and beasts. These are shuffled separately and then each player receives a random unit of each type to put in front of themselves. Then they take a matching unit token for each one in the color of their choice. For example, this is the blue fighter, rogue, wizard, and beast. Each unit has a red health track here and may also have a green ammo or blue mana track on the other side. You now collect and put the matching colored markers on the highest value of each of those related tracks. Now the first player, which can be the youngest person at the table or a player chosen randomly, will pick any one of the groups of four spaces marked with stars like this, which are known as starting locations. They then put one of their unit tokens on each of these spaces. If you're setting up a two player game as we are here, the first player puts any two of their unit figures on any two of a starting location's spaces. Then the other two go on any two spaces of the starting location diagonally across. After the first player has made their choice, the next player in clockwise order adds their pieces to the board in the same way. This is the tactics deck and you'll shuffle it into a face down pile dealing two cards from it to each player. Each person then secretly examines the ones they were dealt and picks one of them to keep. Then all unchosen cards are shuffled back into the deck. These weakened tokens and action dice are then set nearby along with the control card and its three flags arranged on it just like this. And that's the setup. In Tiny Epic Tactics, players will be trying to capture enemies and various control areas in order to score the most points by the end of the game. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going clockwise around and around the table. On your turn, you'll perform four steps, beginning with checking for majority. But that won't really make sense until we understand a few more of the rules, so I'll explain that step a little bit later. The second step is to take up to three actions with your units divided among them as you like. The types of actions you can perform are shown here on your units. You can move, melee attack, missile attack, or cast a spell. If a unit doesn't show a type of action, it cannot perform it. We'll see how each of the different types of actions work in a moment, but just know the first time a unit performs an action during a turn, it can pick any valid action. But if you want the same unit to perform another action during the same turn, it must be different than the action it just performed. The catch is that although the different types of attacks have different names, any action that causes damage to an opponent is considered an attack. So, for example, you can't perform two melee attacks during a turn or cast a spell that does damage and do a missile attack because although they're named different things, they're both considered attacks. So if you do perform two actions with a single unit, it's likely going to be some combination of making a move and attacking or vice versa. Also, as soon as a single figure performs a second action during the same turn, it becomes weakened and you add one of these tokens to it. While it has this token, it cannot take any more actions. Though you may have access to abilities, spells, or tactic cards that could cure this weakness. And we'll learn more about those abilities a little bit later. At the start 
of a new turn, if a player wants, they can spend two of a unit's health by moving the marker here in order to remove its weakened state, allowing that unit to act during the turn. With that understood, now let's talk about the different actions you can take, starting with movement. A unit has movement points equal to the value showing with this symbol, meaning you can move that figure up to this number of spaces. Figures move up, down, left, or right, but never diagonally. And each space of the board can only contain a single figure. But you can move through friendly ones as long as you end the move on an empty space. Though you may never move through enemy pieces. To move from one level to a higher adjacent level costs one extra point of movement no matter how high up you have to step. So to go from here to here costs two points of movement, but so would going from here to here. To move down from a level costs nothing extra. Entering a space with water costs one extra point of movement, but moving out of water doesn't. A unit that passes through or ends its movement on one of these printed villages immediately gains four health, moving their related marker up. They also fully regain any ammo or mana they may have used. But a unit cannot benefit from the same village twice in a single turn and does not benefit from starting their turn on a village. That said, if you do start your turn on a village, you could use a move action to leave it and then enter it again, in which case you would gain the benefits. On the map, you'll find arrows pointing to caves and doors. These represent portals. When moving, you may go from the space beside a portal to a space beside any other portal as if they were adjacent, unless an enemy figure is blocking it. I should also point out you can't attack through portals. This type of space is known as a peak, and it costs one extra point of movement to enter it, but no extra points to leave it. This space is the ballista. It costs an extra point of movement to enter its space, but nothing extra to leave it. So for example, if the rogue here wanted to go directly to this space, it would normally cost one point, plus an extra point because he's going to a higher level, and then an additional point because he's entering the ballista. And those are all the rules for movement, but you don't have to memorize the effects of the different types of terrain, as they're all summarized here on the back of the rule book, along with any other effects that terrain might have on attack actions, which we're about to discuss next, starting with melee attacks. Any unit can melee attack an enemy adjacent to it, not counting diagonally, as long as the enemy is at the same elevation. This figure here, for example, could not be the target of a melee attack from this unit because it's at a lower elevation. The space this figure is on is a peak space, and although thematically that may seem like a higher spot, it is considered to be at the same elevation for attack purposes as this one. And visually on the table, that's exactly what it looks like. So this unit could be the target of a melee attack from this one. Once you've picked a valid target, it then takes an amount of damage based on the attacker's melee strength as shown here. So in this case, three. When a figure takes damage, you reduce its health by that amount. No matter the type of attack, whether melee, missile, or magic, if your target is in water, it takes one extra point of damage. Whereas if the target is in a forest, then it reduces the amount of damage it takes by one. And don't forget you're reminded of that here on the back of the rule book. After damage is dealt, you may choose to roll for knockback if you'd like by rolling a number of dice equal to these knockback symbols here. So in this case, two dice. For each of these knockback symbols that you roll, you then move the enemy that number of spaces directly away from your attacking figure. Any other symbols rolled are ignored. A target cannot be knocked up to a higher level, but it will move down a level if necessary. If a figure would encounter a wall, the edge of the map, another unit, or a portal entrance when being knocked back, it must instead stop. And if this reduces the distance it should have traveled, then it takes a single damage. Also, being knocked into or through a village, peak, water space, or the ballista will not trigger any of their benefits or penalties. If a unit's health is reduced to zero, it's captured. Its figure and tokens are returned to the box, and the player who caused this to happen takes that unit's card, which will be worth points, at the end of the game. But just note, you cannot capture your own units. 
Instead of performing a melee attack, your figure might perform a missile attack. So let's take a look and see how that works. First, the unit must have a green ammo track like this and a target within range. Its range is the value listed beside this symbol. So in this case, a range of four. You add one to your range if you're at a higher elevation than your target, but you lose one from the range if you're at a lower elevation. Now, when counting the distance, don't include diagonals. For example, the range to this target is one, two, three, four, five. I have a range of four plus one extra because I'm at a higher elevation than my target. So that means this target is within range. Just note, you don't have to worry about line of sight in this game. Walls, cliffs, and other figures do not prevent you from targeting a figure. I could even be right here and target this figure. If a unit is on a peak space, it has range to any space on the board, but is not considered to be higher than a figure at the same level. So a unit here targeting it doesn't suffer a penalty to its range. With a valid target, you now pay one ammo to initiate the missile attack and then roll a number of dice equal to the green square symbols here. So two dice in this case. For each of these miss symbols you roll, pay an additional ammo, ignoring any other results. If you're unable to pay, you miss the target. Your ammo is reduced to zero and the action ends. If you can pay, as I was able to do here, you hit the target, dealing damage equal to this green damage value. So, in this case, one point of damage. While playing, though, you should always pay attention to your unit's other abilities listed here. These may provide you with other special effects. For example, this first one here is called Poison, and when doing a melee or missile attack, it says that the target is weakened. So on this successful hit, I would then add this token to this unit. We're not gonna go through all of the different abilities listed on these cards as they're explained directly on them, but we will discuss some of these other symbols that you might see with them a little bit later. Another type of action is casting a spell. Now remember, we said that a single unit cannot take more than one type of action during a turn, and any kind of attack is considered the same type of action. Some spells, though, don't cause damage, and those are not considered attacks. So you could, for example, perform a melee attack during a turn, and then with the same unit, cast a healing spell. Either way, to cast a spell, you need a valid target within its range, which works just like a missile attack, except you look at the values here. Once you have a valid target, you spend one mana to cast the spell, and then they spend between one and three more mana to power the spell up. For each extra mana paid this way, roll a die, counting only these results, which, based on the spell's effect, as explained within the box with this symbol, may cause it to do more damage or provide other effects. Some spells have passive effects, noted by this symbol, that target an area, but damage dealt by these do not affect your allies. If your unit is the primary target that takes damage from a melee, missile, or spell attack, then after the attack is fully resolved, including any knockback effects, you may choose to perform a counter against the unit that attacked you. Now notice I said, if the unit is the primary target, in other words, if instead it was damaged by a spell that's just targeting a general area, then it was not specifically targeting that unit, so that unit cannot perform a counter. Assuming a unit can counter, first check for any reactive symbol, which looks like this, on their card. These abilities will trigger as soon as that unit takes damage, as long as the damage didn't cause its health to be reduced to zero. For example, this ability here says that if a unit performs a melee attack against this unit, it is then weakened. Now, whether you have a reactive effect or not, you may then counter with a melee, missile, or spell attack against the unit that attacked you, as long as it's within range. If the unit that was trying to counter is already weakened, then it cannot counter unless it loses two health first to remove the token. However, you cannot counter a counter. Once a single counter is resolved, the active player resumes their turn. Now we've talked about several abilities, but there is still another type we need to go over. An effect with this symbol is a passive ability. It is considered to always be active and triggers any time its written condition is met. Now although I said there were four actions to pick from during your turn, there's actually one more. 
a special action known as firing the ballista. To do this, your unit must be standing on this space. Then you pick an enemy within four spaces and deal it one damage, knocking it back one space in any direction you choose. For example, I might choose to knock it in this direction because it can't move here, and that would cause it to take another damage. After the ballista attack, then the target may counter. Okay, I promise there are no more actions, but that doesn't mean there isn't more that you can do. Remember, during the setup, you were dealt a tactic card. When playing, if you meet the if condition written on a tactic in your hand, you may reveal it and resolve its effect here. This is a free action and does not count against the three you are normally limited to when taking your turn. Some tactics will have a condition that occurs during an opponent's turn. If you want to play it then, just ask them to wait as soon as the condition has happened while you reveal and then resolve your tactic. Then it goes back to their turn. In either case though, after a tactic has been used, you discard it. Now, as the game goes on, units will be captured and removed from the board. And as soon as a player has only two figures left in play, you immediately remove any weakened tokens on them. Those characters will no longer be weakened by taking two actions, but each one can still not take more than two actions per turn. If you have only a single unit in play, you can take all three of your actions for the turn with it, and even repeat the same actions. But no matter how many units you have on the board, once you've taken up to three actions, it's time for the third step of the turn. Here, you remove weakened tokens from any units that didn't take any actions during your turn. Then, as the last step of your turn, you draw a tactic card and add it to your hand. Now, if you ever have more than two tactic cards, discard any extras at this time into a face-up discard pile. And if you would ever need to draw a tactic when the deck is empty, shuffle its discard pile into a new deck. With the four steps of your turn complete, the next player in clockwise order takes their turn, and so on. However, at the beginning of the video, I skipped over explaining the very first step of a turn, which is where you check for majority control. So let's go back to the table and I'll explain what that means. There are three separate control areas made up of six spaces each marked with flag symbols. Within these areas, one space will have an enlarged flag symbol known as the trigger space. During the first step of your turn, if one of your figures is on the trigger space, check to see if you have majority control in that area, which means having more units on the control area spaces than any other player. And this includes your piece, which is on the trigger space itself. Ties for most units are not considered a majority. If you do have majority, advance the matching colored flag on the control card one space to the right. A triggered area will remain triggered for the rest of the game even if no unit occupies its trigger space from that point on. At the start of a future turn, if you have majority control of an area that was previously triggered, you advance its token one space forward again. But keep in mind, another player could steal majority, either by knocking units out of an area, capturing them, or moving their units in. Now, at the start of that player's turn, since they have majority, they will advance the flag. If a flag reaches the final control space of a card, the player who had majority there when it happened takes the flag. Now, majority in that area will not be checked again for the rest of the game. I should mention, if a triggered area has no units on any of its flag spaces, or if no player has a majority there, then the flag will not advance. And with that understood, you now know all of the rules, and the game will continue with players taking turns until eventually one of two possible game-ending conditions occur. Either all of one player's units will have been captured, or a number of flags have been removed from the control card equal to one less than the number of players. So for example, in this two-player game, the game end would trigger once a single flag has been collected. When either of those conditions have been met, the active player finishes their turn and then all other players get one final turn, which could allow another player to capture a different flag. But then either way, it's time for final scoring. Each player gains five points for every flag token they captured and two points for every one of their units that they still have, which weren't captured, 
and an additional two points for every enemy unit they captured. You also get one more point for each of your units on the board standing in a village space. The player with the most points wins, and in the case of a tie, the tied player with the most surviving units wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the most captured units wins. But if there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most flag tokens wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the most remaining health among their surviving units wins. And if there's still a tie, I'm not sure I believe you, but then in that case, the tied players share the victory. As I mentioned earlier, the game also comes with a variety of other modes. Competitive team play, free-for-all, battle team play, a solo game, and a cooperative adventure mode. But all of those I'll leave for you to discover on your own. There are also a variety of different maps you can pick up, and I'll put a link to those in the description below. Otherwise, that's how you play Tiny Epic Tactics. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.